Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful sunny day at last here in the UK, and uh, we are in the workshop uh, because I'm going to be taught how to make swords. I have a master bladesmith here, Joseph, who is going to try to show me some of the aspects of the probably what was a secret craft, or it was certainly a, a yeah. craft that was protected and kind of almost slightly kind of kept secret from other the ordinary Kind of close-knit sort of people. Close-knit people, them, yeah. so techniques would have been passed on and on, and, and I imagine some of those techniques maybe have lost. Definitely. Maybe we've lost some of them and that kind of stuff. So it's going to be really interesting for me. Over the next few hours, hopefully, we're going to find some of the secrets that go into building the legend that is the sword. So Joseph, you've got some fantastic tools here. Some of them look fairly simple. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to bring them over to the anvil and, and, right, and, yeah. and, and sort of show us? I mean, obviously we've got hammers, but these are kind of a, and it, that's quite heavy. <laughs> that's, got, my, that's my roughing hammer, that one. So, this so is I do all my, all my, all my hard, hard work first right. with that one. That's, that's really quite heavy. And then you've got same, same sort of shape. Same principle, but, but it's just, just more refined. And use it if you get a bit tired as well, so you can switch hammers. So basically you start out moving big lumps of metal yeah. around with a big hammer, and then you move to the smaller one. So your tools vary. You, don't, you need a whole bunch of different tools. And you said, did you make these yourself? Or no, these? These, these ones I've, I've bought myself. Right. But these, these are the, these, so those are, tools I've made myself. For, so, what, so what are these? Do you want to put them on that, that surface? Let's have a, have a so look. That's my drift for doing, for doing pommels. I just made it up myself. So what, what, what on earth? Oh, so that's... And a... that one is for doing the tang on a sword. So that basically means you don't smack your thumb when you're holding it. Yeah, and it keeps your fingers away from the heat of the blade. Right, so you just use that so to run... Sights. Well, I guess we'll go over that in detail, but that's yeah. interesting. So you've just made the tool up. Yeah, well, it, um, it does exist, but yeah. it's just a, a, a take of it. But I think that's really interesting because I would imagine today people do that, but also back in the day, you couldn't just go and order something. You'd have to go, what's the problem I've got to solve? I've got to make a tool for it. Mm -hmm. So bladesmiths and blacksmiths and armourers would have also been engineers and problem solvers, yeah. which You've I think is You've got to be lovely. thinking all the time. Yeah, so it's not just I'll use the tool that comes from the catalogue. It's like, I've got a problem, how do I solve it? And then this is a... Well, that's my starting one. That gives me my start. So that's just an old hammer, yeah, old brick hammer, but I've altered that slightly, yeah. so it's a bit sharper. Yeah. And then I, I aim it, set it up. So, for example, when I start the, the cross guard, yeah. I'll get it warm, find my centre mark first, line it up, yeah. and then yeah. you strike, and it gives you your mark where you start your tank. I think that's great, but I love the fact that you make the tools, you modify yeah, them, because and everything... The, they, they fit the way I work. Because the great thing about that is that every bladesmith will have made their own tools, almost yeah. certainly, and therefore every sword will reflect the sort of nature of the person making it yeah. as much as anything else. So when we go back in history, you're almost imagining the kind of tools that they would have made as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's brilliant. So every tool has signatures of the people that were crafting it. That embedded yeah. in the material itself. Yeah. It's not manufactured in, in, in factories with big machines. It's actually done by hand. So yeah. this is, this is ju these are just... These are uh, just tongues different, holding different size yeah. material. But again, different ends on them. Yeah, just to so if you want to hold old round bar and stuff, or you want to get a better grip on stuff, it's got your cross inside. Yeah, so little, so subtle elements like that make yeah. the tool better. Make a massive difference. But you wouldn't necessarily know unless somebody like you had told me that you can actually hold it that way or that way. Yeah. That's wonderful. So this one I've, this one, um, I've customised by just sharpening the ends there. Yeah. So if I want to get in between a piece of steel that I've folded over, say yeah. if I'm forging an axe or something, I can, I can wedge inside and open the steel up a little bit more easier, where normally it's just been a flat tongue. So you know the problem and you've made the tool to solve yeah, the problem. Customize the tool. And they the tool. constantly get customised. Right. It's the same as punches. Yeah, These brilliant. punches yeah. uh, are all old punches. Yeah. Some are, some are uh, milling steel, Yeah. but they shrink every, every day because I keep changing them all the time. It. Right, right. Um, obviously, they wear out, so you have to change them. And yeah, if you yeah. look in history, you can see chisel marks and they, they alter. And you yeah. can see where either the chisel's wearing out. Well, as, it's or, being, as it's being used. As it's being used. Right. Yeah. Or, the, or the user's getting tired. Right. And uh, so, you know, it's, so, you, so you can see little things 
in manufacturing. Yeah. And sometimes when you're manufacturing something, and then a couple of years later, you'll see it in a sword and yeah. you go, I know why they've done that, because I did that two years ago. Right, right, and it's yeah. a mistake, but yeah. you wouldn't have noticed unless you yes. were the actual craftsman that's right. replicated something on a similar So all line. these little secrets are kind of embedded in, yeah. the, in the swords of the past. And in this world, I do believe that in the medieval period, they didn't want to share the secrets because right. they only kept it in, the, in their families. Right. Because if they wrote booklets, everyone could do it and yeah. it, you'd, you'd kill your market. What, what were you planning on starting with? I'm going to start on the, on the blade because it's, it's rather basic and boring really, I think, making a blade. You say that, but of course that's the, that's the mechanical bit that does the, does the work, isn't it? Yeah. That's the bit that's yeah. going to... So you're starting off with stock. Would older periods of time started off with stock like this? I guess you'd have bought blade I do blade believe, you'd, I think you'd have bought billets, I imagine. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, but it'd be interesting because I, I know that steel... I've seen uh, records of steel that was sort of sold in sort of slightly chunkier bits than this, mm -hmm. and you, that's how it was delivered. So you'd start with something like that, more or less. So we're not, not far away from where they would have started as a bladesmith. You know, the, the, the poetry of steel, I'm going to get all artistic about it. <laughs> the poetry of steel is in the craftsman. If this was made by a machine, it would just churn out the shape. Yeah. But you're kind of finding the shape by hammering it, by observing it. Yeah, by eye. By eye, yeah. And this is why some swords work well in the hand and other swords work well for other people because mm -hmm. of slight different variations, which is, I think, where the magic of swords come from because one sword made by a, a swords master is not going to be the same as the next one he makes. Even if he is making a copy, there's going to be variations. You were talking about millimetre differences and people complaining that it's not an exact replica, but it's close. And it's a different sword, it's got a different spirit. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Just the idea of letting it rest, watching it and seeing what's going on is a, is, is a brilliant piece of the artistry yeah. of making swords. I just like, I once, like, for, for example, this now, if I was in my workshop at home, I'd, I'd sit and I'd sit down and just sit with it and just look at it, yeah. hold it, and you, you'll, as you observe it, you'll be like, ah, so it's quite fat there, or it's a, a lumpy here, yeah. uh, or it's slightly bowed here. But as you're working it quickly in the forge, because you've got to work to, this, yeah. to the heat, you can't, you, I mean, it's, you can see some, but you can't see all of it. Right, so, so now it's time. good to have a break. Yeah, and then maybe you'll get a, you put a chalk line on it, or you just yeah, just just spend twenty minutes just. So you're observing the thing you crafted. Yeah, the smaller things that you can't see while you're working quickly. Yeah. and I'd like yeah. to think that the Vikings or the Celts would have said the sword is now speaking back to you, and telling, telling you, you want. how to change it to yeah. make it have the spirit. Yeah, and that, that's why swords are so magical because that's how they would have been made. Yes, there were lots of swords churned out in large numbers to get them done for an order. But the best swords, the ones with a lot of thought and, and kind of spirit behind them, did have this component to them, which is you're not really doing anything, but you are, you're observing. Yeah. We, I did notice you, when we were looking down, down at the edge, you know, you, you were using sighting down to sort of see it. And, and when you look down the edge of something, you can see everything, because it's exaggerated, because you're using mm -hmm. perspective to kind of shorten it. And you were talking about one bit being slightly bellied yeah. out and... Um, I got a bit thin here, yeah. around this area. And it was rather wide here, which was what I was aiming for. Yeah. So I, you can't, you kind of can't put back on. Once you've shrunk something, it, it's difficult to bring it back on. So I've just began to drift back to the, where the mistake was. 
Right. Yeah. So it's not really a mistake. It's not a it's mistake. Just, it's just changed it slightly. Yes, exactly. It's just a it's slight the, difference. It's the point of being a craft as opposed to mechanical production. Mm -hmm. it, you are you are you know creating something. And I, I like the I just like the idea of the observing it because I often I look at swords and I often look at you know, the handmade swords I use and, and it, it is nice. There is a there is a handedness to it. There's a if you hold it up vertically, you can't see the difference. But when you look down the length of it, you can see oh, right. inf tiny little infinitesimal like differences. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> One of the things I noticed earlier was that you, when you were hammering, you had a rhythm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, that's part of the craftsmanship. But it, you sort of use the, you hit the hammer on the anvil as well as hitting it on the work, don't you? Yeah, so to keep the rhythm, so as, as you're forging. Yeah. Uh, if you if you if you move them if you move in the metal or you want to have a quick 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 observation, it just helps you rebound back in and it keeps the rhythm going. Yes. So one, it, it's I think it's healthier for you. Yeah. I imagine it long run. Yeah. And it it, it just works. It, it just seems it, to be a natural thing. It's yeah. not it's not yeah. an affectation. It just yeah. sort of seems to be the way mm -hmm. that people do want to work. They sort of bounce the hammer. The hammer keeps hitting at the same rhythm, but you don't yeah. sort of want to hit the work all the time. So you can hit the anvil and it bounces. So you kind of keep your body going and working the, the, working the steel that way. So, Joseph, we've been making a lot of noise with the forge, a lot of heat and all that kind of stuff. We've got things roughed out now. What's the next stage? The, the next stage I want to go is uh, start forging the tang in, in the sword blade. Right. And make and that, it match up with the, the tang slot there. So that's the bit that's going to where the handle is going to yeah. be in the end. Yeah. Fantastic. So I want to cut, cut an approximation off and then start tapering this so we can make this all fit together. So we've got some sort of sword shape. Fantastic. Then we can start doing all the fancy bits after that. Brilliant. I'll, uh, I'll leave you to it because you're going to make noise, I imagine. Okay, yep. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of hard work's gone into today, and so um, this is the well, the beginning of the begin. No, the end of the beginning of the sword, because it's it's very clearly sword shaped. Very clearly, you've got a lot of elements that are correct, but there's still quite a lot of work to go before you've made a, a hell of a proper, lot of work. Yeah. yeah. 
And a lot of the work's finer as well, because you, you were shifting a lot of metal around, mm -hmm. you were heating it up, cooling it down, and quite a lot of physical energy has gone into this. And now the next bits are polishing. Just, just and mostly just refining everything, cleaning right. everything up, getting all the lines much more uh, straighter. Yeah. And, and then once I've got everything pretty much symmetrical, neat to my, um, ha till, till I'm happy, yeah. then it becomes more of an artistic sculpture than where I can start decorating and, and putting, the, putting the elements of uh, my own style into it. And that's the bit you really like, isn't that's it? That's my you, you like, part, you, yeah. you like the decorating. I mean, you're incredibly good at this, but you, this is kind of quite directly physical. You're kind of shaping and pushing mm -hmm. the steel around, but the other stuff is a bit more delicate and a bit more Yeah, personal. it's almost like you don't have a choice in these bits. Right. They have to be done. Right. Right. And then now then, it's a blank canvas almost. Yes, fantastic. Obviously, you've got parts of the blades to sort out. Yeah. And you've got the sharpening. Is that presumably... Yeah, profiling the... now. Profiling and uh, uh, different... Uh, oh, I can't remember the word. Taper in it. Uh, right. Not just that way, but yeah. also this way, uh, right. applying the fuller, etc. Right. But most of that's a lot of grinding work now, so... Right. Um, this is just the hammering stages that's been. So, done. would the grinding work again be a medieval thing? Would would that be something you would do? But you would have a bunch of people to do the grinding work. Yeah, and they also had uh, water power, so they'd have used large wheels. So with, with grit on it or a stone or things. Right, so and then to... this would just be pushed up against it, yeah. and that would do the that would do the hard work, the water mm -hmm. power doing it. So, would you be would you do much balancing with this afterwards uh, and finessing or? I usually ask the customer uh, his, his preferable balance point. Uh, but if, it, if it's me freestyle, I just just uh, keep all the components so I can take them off and put them on quite easily. Yeah. And just, just go with the flow, hold it right. and then, until it feels uh, nice or right. comfortable or feels yeah. how I want it to feel. And yeah. then that's, that's, that's how I go about it. So again, there's a lot of uh, craft work rather than kind of mechanical calculations involved as a sort of mm -hmm. a feel and a you know, the, the, the thing has its own spirit. You get a rough gauge as you, as you the more you build, the more you, the more you kind of gauge that that pommel needs to be this size for this blade. And you kind of just, it's just like it just, numbers that are in your head that you don't yeah. really have to calculate. Do you ever get to the stage where you're making a blade and it's, it's uh, sometimes it's just going right and other times just whatever you do seems to go wrong, you just have to stop yeah. and start again? Yeah, and sometimes you, you feel it's going wrong. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you start feeling it's going wrong, you don't try too hard to try and get away with it because you'll just ruin it and then you've wasted time right. and days and you can't, you can't so do that. So it, sometimes you've just got to throw it away. Right, so if the magic's just not quite worked, you just yeah. like, stop fighting against it, leave yeah. it, this one didn't want didn't to make it. Or just go home and then come back tomorrow and have a look at it. Right. Because you might just be angry, stress yourself out right. and ruin it. Sometimes just come home, go home and then come back to it with a, with a nicer, Head. Here's a sword on a journey to being finished. And let's have a look at what we should end up with. This beautiful sword. And you can see the similarities but differences, which is, which is lovely because swords are individual things. They're not made, well, at this level, they're not made in vast quantities in, in exactly the same way. They might be following the same kind of pattern, but there will be individual differences. So it's lovely to think that this kind of thing might become this beautiful object um, in a few days, weeks? A couple of days. A couple of days work. Isn't that lovely? Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe, and don't forget to use that notification button Next week, we've got something a little bit different to show you.